good evening again, uh, everyone watching us from uh, all over the world. Tonight is uh, congenital heart disease uh, at CEC. Uh, this is the congenital heart disease course uh, webinar number nine, titled uh, Transposition of the Great Arteries. This is the first part involving the introduction, the pathophysiology, and the echocardiography and the imaging of TGA. I'm very glad to have tonight a very elegant board of speakers and moderators. I have uh, Dr. Sara Muscatelli. She's currently the fellow at Royal Brompton uh, in the field of congenital heart disease. Uh, Sara is from Italy. She's a board member of the Italian Cardiologist of Tomorrow, and she's a vice uh, secretary of the International Young Academy of Cardiology. I'm very glad to have Sara on board today. She will speak about the introduction and the pathophysiology of the TGA. This will be followed by a very strong scientific lecture by my dear friend, Professor Yasser Sidi, uh, Echocardiography and Imaging of TGA. Yasser is the Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Cairo University and Consultant of Pediatric Cardiology at Abu Rish Hospital and at Aswan Heart Center. Uh, I'm very glad also to introduce our uh, moderators tonight. I'm very glad to have on board uh, Dr. Hatem Hosni, consultant uh, pediatric cardiac surgery at Aswan Heart Center. Uh, Dr. Soha Rumeh, consultant adult congenital heart disease at Aswan Heart Center, and she's the director of the Advanced Cardiac Imaging Program. And my dear friend and brother, of course, Dr. Khalid Shams, lecturer of cardiology at Helwan University. So I will not make the introduction longer than that. I will stop sharing my slide now. And Sarah can, sh can start uh, sharing her slide and uh, introducing us to TGA. So uh, thank you, Sarah. You can start uh, now, please. Thank you very much for the introduction and the presentation. Uh, today, I will just give a talk uh, about uh, uh, the complete transposition of the great arteries. I will be very synthetic just to introduce this uh, condition that is a congenital heart disease. Actually, it's one of the most common. Um, it's represented to, from to 5 to 6 uh, percent of all the congenital heart disease, and it's defined as a cyanotic congenital heart disease. This condition is more common in males than females. In fact, uh, the ratio is a three to one. And in less than 10% of the cases, uh, we can find it associated to uh, chromosomal abnormalities or also other malformation the other, uh, of other organs. Actually, uh, what is this condition? Uh, it is uh, a um, congenital disease uh, characterized by the fact that the aorta arises from a morphological uh, right ventricle and uh, the, um, uh, the pulmonary artery arises instead from a left uh, a morphological left ventricle. Uh, this condition is also called from the American uh, DTGA and D derives from the dextro position uh, uh, of the aorta that actually in this condition is uh, not only comes from the right ventricle, but is also uh, anterior to the uh, pulmonary artery and is also on the right. Um, this uh, um, connotation is made to distinguish uh, this condition from another congenital heart disease that we are not going to, uh, to deal today, that is the uh, congenital corrected uh, transposition of the right artery. The differentiation from the two conditions is simple. Actually, in the uh, DTGA, we have um, uh, a, a right ventricle that gives uh, 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 that arises uh, no, or just a discordance between the ventricle and the uh, and the great valve vessel, both in the two ventricles. Instead, in the corrected uh, congenital uh, transposition of the great arteries, uh, we have a discordance not only between the ventricle and the great vessels, but also between the atrium and the ventricle. So the left atrium will be connected to the right ventricle. Okay, And this is the main uh, distinction uh, between the two conditions. Um, these are some uh, very simple images just to explain what I said before, that actually the aorta is on the right side and uh, arises from the right ventricle and uh, that both the, the great uh, arteries uh, if seen in the autoptic images of the center, but also in the echo imaging uh, on the, the right, the course uh, parallels uh, one to another. And this is quite characteristic of this uh, condition. This is a very nice video, oh, sorry, a nice video that uh, uh, advances to the left ventricle and goes to the aorta. 
in this condition, we have exactly the opposite. So uh, the venous blood that arises from the two colors arrives in the, in the red ventricle, and then it goes into the aorta, as you can see from this image. Instead, the oxygenated blood arrives uh, from the pulmonary veins into the left ventricle, and then it goes to the pulmonary artery. And actually, there are two circulations that are parallel one to another, and that cannot guarantee uh, the life. Um, what we need uh, is in order to guarantee the life in uh, the newborns that have these two circulation in parallel that not communicate one to another is to have a communication. And the first point where we can have this communication uh, is the interatrial uh, septum. In particular, as you can see from the next image, at the level of the from a valley that can uh, be uh, can can remain open after the birth, and so we have the condition of the patent from a valley. But also of the patent from a valley, we can also have the uh, real holes in this uh, interatrium interatrium septum, uh, so AST that are other congenital condition. But this is not the only point of communication between the two circulations. We can also have um, a PDA, so a patent ductus arteriosus that remain open also with the use of prostins, uh, or a VST, uh, so a communication on the level of the interventricular septum that you can see in this image, echo image. Uh, the TGA, the TDGA, has an anatomical classification. The 50% of the causes is a simple condition with no other congenital heart diseases associated. In the 40% of the cases, it is associated uh, to a VSD. And in lower cases, it's also associated with a VSD and a pulmonary obstruction that can be at the can be at the level of the valve, pulmonary valve, or under the valve. At other times, it's also connected, uh, associated with the anaortic coartation. To this anatomical classification, uh, correspond a pathophysiological classification. In fact, the simple TGA we can have uh, in the simple TGA we have a hyperafflux of blood at the level of the uh, of the lungs, so a great pulmonary influx with no mixing. Uh, and in the second type, we still have a hyperafflux of blood to the lungs, so a great pulmonary influx, but there is also a point of mixing. In the third type of, uh, um, of TGA, we instead have a lower pulmonary influx because we have a stenosis at the level of the pulmonary artery. Uh, I want to mention another thing that will be explained better later in the echocardiographic uh, presentation, that uh, it's a fact that a lot of the patients with the congen this condition, uh, one third of them, has also uh, coronary artery anomalies. The most common is uh, the circumflex artery that the derives from the right coronary, or uh, we can have also in other cases, but they are, these are more rare, only one coronary, or a right coronary that gives the region to branches to the left ventricle, or a single left coronary artery that gives branches to uh, the right ventricle. Uh, in the last, we can have an inverted origin of the left and the right coronary. And in both this condition, the origin can be also intramural. The presence of an intramural origin or also of only, only one coronary artery is associated with a lower and a worse survival of the, of the patients. Uh, actually, as I said at the beginning, this uh, TGA is not uh, compatible with life. So the newborns uh, got uh, um, became cyanotic and polypnoic, and they developed acidosis until the death. But if we intervene rapidly, um, the survival grows up to more than 90%. This is the last slide that actually underlined the importance of the fatal echocardiogram. So to the importance of a diagnosis that is uh, antenatal, because if we know that the fetum has this uh, condition, we can better organize the delivery and uh, schedule uh, the intervention. I mean, from a series a series of data as uh, the presence of a VSD or the, um, the measure or, and uh, the dimension of the PFO, uh, we can understand that if the patient has Gonna have, uh, was gonna need an intervention when uh, uh, he or she burns, or if we can delay this intervention. Thank you very much. I handed my uh, presentation. Then I so th thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, 
your uh, your talk um, highlights important anatomic um, uh, features in the in the TGE. Uh, one of which that I would like to to highlight also here, uh, because uh, th this has clinical implication and also um, will be uh, evident in the in the echo views, is the relationship between the uh, two outflow tracts. Uh, your your video uh, beautifully highlighted that uh, in the normal both outflow tracts cross each other, um, while in the uh, in the DTGE they come they come out parallel. And uh, this was evident in the in the last uh, view that you showed in the in the fetal echo, which is so the, the parallel uh, relation of both outflow tracts is not normal, and this is most probably uh, a TGA. I think Yasser will also uh, show us very nice pictures for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. See you. So uh, I will start my presentation. Can uh, everybody hear me and see the screen? Yes, yeah. yes, thank you. Okay, uh, th uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zahra. Thank you, all board members. Uh, thank you for the channel, the cardiology education channel for this uh, opportunity. Uh, today we are, we're going to talk about uh, the echocardiography and imaging modality in assessing uh, and diagnosis of uh, uh, dextrotransposition. So as Dr. Sara stated in brief, uh, uh, the pathophysiology occurs, in, there are two parallel uh, circulations. Uh, the aorta arises uh, from the right ventricle while the pulmonary arises from the left ventricle. So both of them, these are two parallel circulation. Unless this child have uh, shown uh, whether on the atrial level or ventricular level or ductus arteriosus, this child is going to die. It is incompatible with life. So what happened? It is a case of atrioventricular concordance, but ventricular arterial discordance. The aorta arises anteriorly, but not usually we will see different variations in different types of uh, transposition. So uh, basically uh, for all congenital heart disease, we would like to start uh, uh, in a traditional way by uh, viewing the X-ray. In uh, uh, dextrotransposition, there are different uh, variations, but commonly uh, as we know, uh, it is the Agon side shape, uh, which uh, identifies the characteristics of the transposition with a variable uh, uh, vascularity of the lungs, depending on the presence or absence of uh, shots. So uh, to start, uh, what would be the steps for echocardiography assessment in cases of transposition? Cases of transposition uh, are very critical trials. It is one of the most common congenital cyanotic heart disease as Dr. Sarah stated, but to diagnose this early as much as possible and intervene rapidly, we need a proper uh, approach of diagnosis and management uh, in a higher cardiac center. So points to be covered by any uh, echocardiographer is, uh, uh, is their ventricular arterial uh, discordance. Uh, what are the types of shunts? Do we have an atrial septal defect? Do I have a ventricular septal defect? Is there a patent ductus arteriosus? What is the size of every shunt? And what is the direction of these shunts? It is very important also to detect the pulmonary artery pressure in such cases and the morphology of atrioventricular valves because this would have implication on the surgery. Also, the left ventricular size and function is very crucial crucial to determine the surgical strategy and uh, the approach in such cases. Another point is the left ventricular outflow tract, and we will see that we have uh, different uh, formations of the left ventricular outflow tract. It could be either fixed obstruction or could be a dynamic obstruction. The morphology of the aortic and the pulmonary valves are very important to determine the approach that I will do and the relationship of the great vessels. Very important point to cover uh, is the coronary anatomy and the aortic uh, arch uh, 
these are the points that we will uh, cover in the topic. So uh, to understand uh, uh, our uh, protocol, we uh, usually start in a segmental uh, pattern. We start by, uh, uh, in a segmental approach, we start by the situs by identifying the IVC and the aorta. Then we state that, that there is uh, AV concordance and ventricular arterial discordance. Then we scan for the systemic and pulmonary venous drainage. We detect presence or absence of intracardiac shunts. We can detect also the outflow tract obstruction. We uh, finalize by the coronary anatomy and the arch anatomy. So in briefing, these are uh, the main uh, parameters we want to, to detect by echo, to detect the transposition. Other associations are very important, like uh, presence of shunts or coarctation or outflow tract and the presence of mapcus. So uh, uh, if I am the cardiologist, after uh, verifying the orientation and the coronary and the morphology and the points which I assessed and the, any associated lesions like presence of uh, shunt or coarctation or outflow tract obstruction or presence of uh, uh, mapcus. So there are several questions I need to ask. Do I have all the information? So am I convinced by uh, diagnosis? Is my report comprehensive? Is it in details the surgeon uh, needs? So then I will put what is going to be my plan. Did I did my case? These are the questions we should bear in mind while diagnosing a case of transposition. So what will happen? This, there should be a discussion between the surgeon and the cardiologist. Uh, the surgeon needs to hear uh, several points. Uh, uh, is it a TGA? So I should prove this. Is there any other associations? Is there any other cardiac findings? Very important question. If this is patient switchable and what are the precautions? These are the questions where the surgeons uh, usually ask. So uh, the cardiology have a discussion with the surgeons as we usually do, as most cardiac centers do. He should e emphasize on the uh, presence of a restrictive or unrestrictive ASD. Do we have a patent ductus? Do we start a prostaglandin? Do we do, we do proceed for a Rushkin procedure first? If, do we have a significant ventricular septal defect? Do I have a significant left ventricular outflow tract obstruction? Is my obstruction? fixed or dynamic. But a very important answer the surgeons need to know, is this child switchable or unswitchable? Because it will go in another direction. So I should emphasize on the left ventricular shape and I detect it by the septal curvature, whether the septum is midline or bowing towards the left ventricle. So if it is a midline septum, so this means that the left ventricle is capable of maintaining the systemic circulation and this patient can be switched by while uh, if the septum is bowing towards the left ventricle this means that the left ventricle is the beginning to collapse and it will not maintain such circulation and i should think with my surgeon about uh, further uh, options as we will see in the coming slides other important point is the left ventricular mass and most literature have agreed to uh, left ventricular mass more than 35 gram per meter squared is adequate uh, for maintaining systemic circulation and uh, keeping the patient in a good condition, uh, favorable arterial switch operation. The third and the last point is the posterior wall thickness after omitting the papillary muscle. These three parameters are very important in determining this important question. So for a decision making for any uh, procedure, uh, I should have uh, the LV condition, uh, the time, the age, and uh, if he had a rush long ago, I should uh, uh, show my surgeon the echo. If I have a, uh, additional lesions, I, as I stated, like a dynamic outflow tract obstruction, the ASD, the V is D and PDA, additional lesions which uh, will make the uh, case unfavorable for arterial switch, like fixed outflow tract obstruction, coarctation or hypoplastic arch, AV is the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So some lesions are favorable, 
which is are uh, these uh, types and some lesions are unfavorable. In every case, we will discuss it with our surgeons to determine the surgical strategy and the surgical approach in every case. So case by case will be discussed. So also the capabilities of the center, whether you have intraoperative capable surgeons, anesthesia and perfusion, do you have uh, adequate post-operative resources, ICU physicians and nurses and all your resources usually determine uh, to a big extent uh, your uh, surgical strategy. So uh, segmental approach uh, uh, for echo assessment, usually we start in congenital heart disease by the uh, uh, subzyphoid uh, uh, approach, uh, scanning the atrial septum, then uh, uh, we uh, uh, assign the great vessels, see the, if the V is D, the aortic and pulmonary lesions could be detected from that view. The juxtaposition of atrial appendage, which have uh, very uh, important surgical implications in such cases, and also the infundibular anatomy. So, uh, to start uh, by the uh, subdiphoid, uh, the, so this is a, a, a long axis subcostal view with a restrictive AZ. So, how did I know that this is a restrictive ASD? Uh, this, this patient have Rushkin, so I should uh, see the color flow across this ASD and see the continuous flow also. So that's, I get the color flow. So in that view, which is the subcoastal uh, uh, at the atrial level, I detect the shunt size, the shunt magnitude, whether this shunt is restrictive or uh, unrestrictive. This will, uh, be very important in referring such cases because if he had adequate mixing, so I am uh, in favor of uh, referring to surgery direct. But if the ASD is restrictive, as I see it from that view with a high jet velocity and the left to right shunt as I see, so this patient might need either a prostaglandin infusion till referral for surgery or the balloon atrial septostomy procedure, or what we say, uh, we know all the uh, brush procedure. Uh, another uh, important uh, uh, information from the subcostal view is the ventricular size, the outflow tract. So we scan the atrial septum, also we scan the ventricular septum, and we sweep anterior and posterior for detecting any additional ventricular septal defect and uh, uh, detecting the size and function of both ventricles, sweeping anterior and posterior, detecting the atrial septum, as we see at the end of the loop, then moving uh, to the ventricular level, we can see a ventricular defect in such cases, no additional defects. And we can see also the infundibular anatomy of both vessels, which can be more in that view. Here we can see the aorta, and we can see uh, arising from the right ventricle. These are the coronaries. So this is my point. So I made my uh, diagnosis. Also, the pulmonary begins to appear. Uh, both anatomy of both uh, infundibular uh, anatomy could be detected, whether I have double coli or whether I have absent coli. So this will make my case to a big extent. Also, the ventricular size in such cases is very important and could be detected from such view preliminary until moving to different views. So what would be uh, uh, other views? I will go then segmentally to the apical view to detect the AV valve function, the anatomy, the ventricular size and function. Do I have a ventricular septal defect? Do I have intracardiac shunt? What is the state of the outflow tracts, especially the left ventricular outflow tract? Do I have an obstruction? Is this obstruction fixed or uh, dynamic? And also, I can sweep to the apical five chamber to detect the semi lunar valve and reach in uh, a big way my diagnosis. So, this is a very important view. Uh, we can detect the function from that view only. So, by starting the loop, this is uh, uh, an apical four chamber moving to the five chamber. I have stopped the loop. So, this is the vessel arising from that ventricle. So this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle. So I found that this vessel is a branching vessel. So this is a pulmonary uh, vessel arising from the left ventricle. Then by moving towards it, I found a ventricular septal defect with a posterior deviation of the uh, septum. And then at the end of the loop, I could detect the aorta arising from the right ventricle. 
So I made my case. So from that view, I get my case. This is a case of transposition with a ventricular septal defect with the pulmonary arising from the, uh, with the aorta arising anteriorly from the right ventricle and the pulmonary arising posteriorly from the left ventricle. So what are other views I need to assess? I would go for the parasternal view. Why? Because I will assign the relation with the, uh, of the great arteries because the relation of the great vessels is very important for surgeons and have surgical implications. If there are a parallel relationship of vessels, what are the AV valves uh, morphology? Because uh, it will have a surgical implication on the decision of arterial switch. Again, the incandibular anatomy is very important as we see. And then I move to the high parasternal view to detect the coronary pattern. And this is one of the most crucial uh, decisions, uh, the type of the coronary as we see, as we will see in the coming slides, because this is the cornerstone of the arterial switch operation. It is a major step. And we, uh, uh, the surgeon would like to know the type uh, of coronaries before uh, going to surgery. There are different variables uh, and uh, different uh, coronary patterns carries the surgical risk of uh, injury. And Finally, I finish my case by suprasternal, uh, suprasternal view. What is the suprasternal view? The suprasternal view, uh, I detect the uh, presence of the patent ductus arteriosus and the anatomy of the arch. And we will see uh, later, the anatomy of the arch is very crucial in such cases because uh, different variables, uh, we can see uh, a whole spectrum from coarchitation to a hypoplastic arch to an interrupted aortic arch in uh, very common to be associated with transposition. So to explain these views, uh, we will take a sample of echo. So this is uh, the parasternal view. So as we see, we can see the dipping posterior of the pulmonary and the aorta arises from the right ventricle. So this is the left ventricle, this is the parallel relations of the great vessels or the dipping posteriorly of the pulmonary artery or dipping downwards, it is very characteristic of transposition from the parasternal view. Also, we can detect the outflow tract. Is it patent outflow tract? Do we have a fixed obstruction? Do I have a dynamic obstruction? And uh, the condition of the left ventricle could be assessed from this view also by detecting the thickness of the posterior wall. By detecting the posterior wall, it is very important to measure or omit the papillary muscle. Please take care not to uh, incorporate the papillary muscle in estimating the thickness of the posterior wall. It is very important to avoid this because you, you could have a false uh, secure sensation of a switchable ventricle by encountering the uh, papillary muscle in your calculations. And uh, you, you can find uh, this finding could be a misleading. So very important to detect in such cases. Then we sweep after uh, the parasternal view and detecting the anatomy and the findings we, we just mentioned. We go to the high parasternal view to detect the uh, uh, relation of the great vessels. The coronary anatomy will be explained in thorough details in the coming slide, the morphology of the semilunar valves is uh, usually the aorta is anterior and to the right, but in such case, it is entirely anterior. We will have different variation and we will see the different variations in the coming slide. And this is the pulmonary uh, valve. How do, uh, did we know the aorta carries the coronaries and the pulmonary is a branching vessel? So this is a very important view is the short axis parasternal or we say the modified parasternal or the high parasternal view. We usually use it to uh, detect the transposition. And we have uh, in literature uh, have used the two circle, the two circles uh, appearance of the, the great vessels. So after uh, detecting uh, these views, what other views I will go for? Then I will end my case by the suprasternal long axis view. 
This is a long axis uh, suprasternal view. This is a very important to determine the anatomy of the arch. We can see that this is uh, the arch vessels uh, with a normal branching pattern. And we can see that there is a very restrictive PDE. How did I know? I will put a color. So uh, color compare usually determine the anatomy of the arch and the pay, uh, uh, presence uh, of uh, a patent ductus arteriosus. In such cases, uh, in such case, I, I could have a, a very restrictive uh, patent ductus arteriosus. And then in such case, if the patient clinically matching, I will start prostaglandin or refer to uh, Rushkin. But further uh, strategies will be discussed in the coming webinars. So let us uh, fix or uh, focus on the uh, a diagnosis and the management. So, we will start, as Dr. Sara said in the first part of the lecture, uh, by stating the different types of transposition. The most uh, important type is the simple TGA, or what we say, the, the transposition with intact interventricular septum. These are the most important, these are the most common. Uh, these are almost 50% of cases. Here, this is a specimen. We are opening the left ventricle. We can see the pulmonary trunk with the, with the branching pattern arising from the left ventricle. And uh, this is the left ventricle and we cannot see any uh, intracardiac defect. This is the most important. This is the most common, as we said. Uh, usually, uh, we detect by different echo maneuvers. We will see in the coming uh, slides. In the parasternal view, it's very important to uh, see the great vessels arising from the left ventricle diving posteriorly in parallel relations with other vessels. And usually, this view is uh, very important to evaluate the outflow tract obstruction. So uh, we will uh, detect uh, the intact uh, ventricular septum cases. We will start. So what are this view? This is the important view. Usually we start by it. So I will uh, uh, stop the loop here. This is an apical four chamber sweeping anteriorly to detect the five chamber view and stopping here to detect these vessels is branching. We can see uh, this vessel branch to a right branch to a left branch, and it is arising from the posterior chamber. While the anterior chamber, we can detect the other vessels arising from the anterior chamber with the coronary uh, arising from it. So from this view, I could detect the diagnosis of uh, transposition and uh, intact septum. I, do, I don't have any uh, ventricular defect. So what is the state of uh, ventricular septum in such case? So as we see, I stopped the loop, so we can see that the septum is So the septum bulging. looks uh, 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 yeah. com compressing the left ventricle, bulging towards the left, and uh, the right ventricle seems uh, much bigger than the left. Uh, yes, you can see exactly. that, the, that the left, uh, left ventricle looks like a banana shape. Huh? Exactly what we call, uh, Dr. Hatem, the banana-shaped or crescent-shaped uh, mm -hmm. left ventricle. So uh, this is very important because if I present my case to Dr. Hatem or any surgeon, if you present to uh, your surgeon, he will ask different questions. What is the age? What is the time of the echo? Because it, as we see in the coming webinar, it, uh, all the, these questions have uh, an implication on the surgical decision. But what we know, uh, we got the information that the septum bulged towards the left ventricle, and this is a case of uh, TG. I have a different scenario. Uh, looking into the, the the lateral wall of the left ventricle in the first image, um, yeah. uh, I think this is a, a quite thin uh, free wall. Exactly. So probably. Uh, so uh, so from that view only, I could detect uh, that the septum the, is yes exactly. Yeah. So so That's... we assume that the, the LV pressure is quite low because. Um, uh, if the LV pressure is much lower than the right ventricular pressure, then the septum is pushed towards the left. And if the LV pressure is very low and this stays for a while, then the, the possible thickness will be much thinner. So exactly. this, this ventricle doesn't seem to be uh, uh, strong enough to sustain systemic circulation. I agree totally with you, Dr. Hatem. So I get a, a very uh, important information just from that view that this patient is not favorable 
uh, for a switch. But I recommend before taking uh, a decision, uh, fulfill your study, move to all views because this is a very crucial. You will change the child life. Uh, you will have a very important and crucial decision. Uh, Try to convince your surgeon, but if uh, all views verified your uh, uh, assumption, then uh, as Dr. Hatem said, this case will not be a uh, favorable case of switch. So we will move to another view, the same view, but another case. We can see the difference. We can see the difference. What is the difference between the first uh, upper case and the lower case? This is the same view, apical chamber, but here the difference the septum is in midline and the uh, posterior wall is thickened. This ventricle is capable of maintaining the systemic circulation. This ventricle is favorable of arterial switch, although the right side is dilated, but this ventricle is a very uh, good candidate for arterial switch. Uh, what is your opinion, Dr. Hatton, for this case? I agree, yes, sir. As you say, the, although the right ventricle is big, but the septum is not the, uh, pushed towards the left like the the previous one, and uh, as you say, if you look if you look at the at the free wall of the left ventricle, it is much thicker than the upper one. Yes, that's what we are calling. But uh, as Dr. Hatem said, we need confirmation, so we will go for the parasternal long axis view, as we stated uh, just uh, moments before. Uh, uh, here we can see that this ventricle is thickened. The uh, left ventricular mass is, uh, if calculated, it will be more than the 35 we, we just stated. The posterior wall is thickened. We we, we we went far away from the papillary muscle and we estimated and the- It was the, the papillary muscle where, where you were pointing, yes? Yeah, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the cordy, Dr. Hatton, and this is the level of papillary muscle. This is the end of the papillary muscle. So any measurement, I will stop the image to see where I will image. I will. Just here, uh, Dr. Hatem, I, I will measure it. So we should not measure papillary muscle and think that this is a thick LV wall because um, um, uh, yes. we're measuring here the free wall, not and because this would be only papillary muscle and the rest of the ventricle would, would not be that thick. So we shouldn't uh, take decisions on, on such measurement. I agree. Exactly. And uh, also this view is very important to determine the patency of left out ventricular tract. Here we can see a little bit of, uh, we usually often they, uh, see this ridge, it is a dynamic, not fixed, and by uh, correcting switch, it uh, correct itself. And we will discuss the different mechanism of the outflow tract later uh, in the coming slides. But from that view, I made my case also that uh, this ventricle is uh, thickened, the mass is adequate for maintaining systemic circulation, and the posterior wall thick is very capable of maintaining such circulation. And I have my discussion with my surgeon, and I got the point that this patient is favorable for arterial switch. For confirmation, I will go for the short axis uh, parasternal view. Here is very important for surgeon. I have a very midline septum. I will stop to, to show it. This is. So this is a midline septum, and I have a very thick and posterior wall. I'm, I'm avoiding, the, this is the papillary muscle. Here I measure my uh, posterior wall thickness. So I, uh, I'm quite convinced now that this case is totally different from the uh, uh, initial case. So this patient is usually will be a favorable candidate of arterial switch operation. Agree, Dr. Hadden? Agree, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, we will move uh, for uh, the other types of uh, transposition as Dr. Sarah sorry, uh, sorry, yes, sir, for interruption. Before going to the other types, um, I have a question about uh, the previous slides. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for showing an, a very illustrative uh, echocardiographic images. And uh, we are discussing a very important issue uh, about uh, the suitability for a switch. Uh, two very important points are the septal curvature and the thickness of the posterior wall. A, a very frequently asked question about the thickness of the posterior wall uh, and deciding whether it is a sin and you would, you would defer doing a switch or you will go for switch. How thin is thin and how thick is thick? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a good question, Dr. Harry. Thanks for uh, this question. Uh, there have been uh, published papers for, uh, for uh, this uh, question, and uh, 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 there is a, a figure which uh, many centers agreed upon. If you measured correctly, omitting the papillary muscle, so uh, any figure more than 0.3 would be uh, favorable for uh, uh, switchability. Some some center says 0.28, but I would go for 0.3. Do you agree, Hatton? Um, a difficult question, yes, sir. Uh, I actually agree with your slide uh, um, saying that it's a, it's a multifactorial decision. So yes. uh, um, uh, I do not, at least we usually get impression from the echo images, but uh, we, we do not have a single parameter that we just say, um, okay, this is switchable. Uh, I, would, I would go, as you say, the age is very, very, very important in a patient who is a TG intact septum. Probably anybody less than three weeks of age um, is probably suitable for, uh, for arterial switch. Uh, some patients may stay switchable uh, even uh, further than that, up to a month. But, uh, but the age, so any, anybody who's coming first week or 10 days, you just do not look at the, at the left ventricle. He's most probably uh, still, uh, still switchable. Um, uh, also, as you say, uh, the time since Rushkin. So patients who have really big ASD or patients who had uh, very early um, uh, Rushkin that caused the atrial septum to be wide open, these patients get... Um, 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 very quick, uh, uh, significant unloading of the left ventricle. So the left ventricle uh, becomes unconditioned because of uh, there is no pressure load or not even volume load. So they do they decondition uh, uh, f uh, much faster. Uh, and exactly as you said, the, the septal curvature is a very important parameter. The posterior wall thickness. Um, so yes, um, ranging three three point five millimeters. Uh, um, also, any anything that can cause increase in LV pressure, like having um, a significant DSD, a significant LVOT obstruction, either fixed or dynamic. And um, uh, uh, please, everybody remember, LVOT obstruction here, we mean subpulmonic obstruction. So because the left ventricle is, is going to the, to the pulmonary. So when we say LVOT obstruction, we mean pulmonary stenosis. And uh, some patients will actually have significant aortopulmonary collaterals. So um, uh, these patients have um, a very high pulmonary flow, so very high pulmonary venous return. And so the, the LV filling is much, uh, much higher. And obviously patients having large PDA because this increased pulmonary flow so increases the volume load of the ventricle, but also transmits systemic pressure into the pulmonary, which also keeps the LV um, uh, uh, conditioned. So it, it is a multifactorial. Uh, yes, the, the free wall thickness is an important parameter in that, but um, I think most centers would, would have a big um, uh, overview on all, all, all parameters. The interesting thing here, if a patient comes uh, a bit late, do you think um, measuring LV mass by MRI um, uh, is helpful? What do you think so? Um, hi. Uh, well, this uh, question is really uh, difficult to be answered. Uh, personally, yes, I think it might have a role, but uh, uh, if you are referring to the LV mass, the famous LV mass that uh, LV is conditioned if uh, the LV mass is more than 35. So this paper actually is uh, an echo paper uh, published somewhere in late uh, 80s. And actually, it was not measuring the LV mass. It was estimating the LV mass through a lot of calculation. Uh, and uh, if anybody is interested, I can send the link of uh, this paper. This is a very famous uh, paper. But if you go through it, it's an overrated paper because uh, many patients have a VSD. And according to this estimation uh, by ECHO, uh, were, were, were labeled as non-conditioned LV. So actually, the problem not in the patient who had a significant VSD because he has a conditioned LV, but in the measure, in the way that uh, uh, used it to estimate the LV mass. Uh, I think because it's not uh, a, a current problem in, uh, uh, in the places who are experts in the MRI. So this study 
uh, not uh, in the top list to do. But I think in our countries and maybe in the other countries where uh, arterial switch is not um, uh, available for all patients, so we can collectively do a multi study, a multi center study. As you said, it's multifactorial, but uh, might be the LV mass. Uh, which can be calculated now by MRI, so we can, it's not estimation like an echo, but can be calculated, but I think it's uh, it's an idea for global collective research to be done, but until now, I don't think that um, that 35 gram per meter square should be uh, universally uh, used as um, a, um, a parameter for, or a single parameter as LV. So also as a, a, a supportive uh, a parameter and, uh, rather than the single most important parameter. So yeah, actually, uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, in, in our in our clinical practice, 35 uh, gram per meter square actually we couldn't we couldn't support or or uh, dis uh, disagree with this uh, figure so i think uh, that uh, collective uh, effort should be done in that uh, in that area I'm, I'm quite happy having this agreement from both uh, cardiologists and cardiac surgeons that uh, uh, although we have a cutoff value of three millimeter uh, regarding sickness of the posterior wall, we should uh, depend on all factors. As you all said, it is a multifactorial decision depending on the septal curvature, the sickness of uh, the posterior wall. It's really multifactorial. Uh, another issue uh, you raised, Hatem, about uh, uh, the deconditioning of the left ventricle, and another uh, uh, very uh, common debate between the cardiologist and the surgeons uh, regarding doing the rush and deconditioning the left ventricle or going directly to an arterial switch. Uh, what's your opinion? <laughs> Again, a difficult question to answer. So. Uh, Although the uh, doing Ruskin and, and for everybody, if you're not familiar, Ruskin is balloon atrial septostomy. So uh, uh, if the patient doesn't have enough mixing, which is crucial for to, to sustain oxygenation and sustain life, um, uh, so balloon atrial septostomy uh, will create a large ASD, uh, and this allows um, um, the best mixing um, at the atrial level. Sounds this like mix depends on the conditioning the left ventricle. Yes, so th this uh, helps to stabilize the, the patient condition, um, improves the saturations um, a lot, uh, can help them to get off ventilator, can help them to, uh, um, to, to stop prostin, uh, so they don't um, uh, depend on the PDA anymore. But on the other hand, this causes significant unloading of the volume load on the left ventricle. And this causes the patients to really quickly decondition the left ventricle. So uh, uh, let's say if, uh, if two patients have nearly the same anatomy, TGA anatomy, one of them had a restrictive ASD and kept with a saturation of 60s. And he, was, um, uh, he managed to do the, the operation at like 20 days of age. Um, uh, while on the other hand, the other patient had um, a widely open Rushkin uh, at day two of age and then uh, did the operation at, at 20 days. The, the left ventricle of the patient who had the Ruskin will suffer a lot more after the operation than the patient who had um, uh, the restrictive ASD. So again, this is difficult because uh, patients can be very, very unstable. They can stay on ventilators, uh, stay on prostin. Prostin, on the other hand, even the, the patient if uh, is not ventilated. Uh, prostin can cause apnea in itself, so uh, it might cause the patient to, uh, to need ventilation. And especially if the, the center where, where the patient uh, is currently in um, um, doesn't have experience doing arterial switch and he needs transfer, especially for, for um, a long um, uh, uh, distance, um, getting the patient only on prostin and um, uh, causing him to travel is a bit unsafe. So it might then be um, um, more safe to do the Rushkin than send him. But if a, a, a patient with a TGE uh, had a Rushkin, um, you should have a plan to um, immediately send him to a place to do the arterial switch because the, uh, the, the clock ticks a lot faster. Um, uh, he will become um, unswitchable very, very quickly. Can I add something? Yes, please, yes. Sure, yes. Uh, there, there have been uh, published data recently that there, uh, there is association between the neurocognitive 
impairment after arterial switch, which is a late result, which we can see it, and uh, uh, delaying the timing of arterial switch. So the, the data uh, supports doing Rushkin as much as you can to improve the oxygenation, because if you improve the oxygenation, the uh, impairment will decrease and uh, referring him to surgery. So as uh, Dr. Hatton said, I would, uh, if I will refer this patient, I will favor doing a Rushkin, but on the condition, not uh, delaying the surgery, because as we all know that the LV will lose its capacitance by uh, doing the Rushkin. So uh, I, if I have the decision, uh, if the patient is unstable, I will do the Rushkin uh, and refer him to a higher cardiac center. But if I am in already cardiac center uh, and uh, the patient presented to me, I would uh, do uh, uh, the surgery immediately. Okay. And, and actually, um, I, I do not want to send the message that um, any time below three weeks is okay. So uh, let's do everybody at three weeks of age uh, because uh, there is a significant increase in mortality, post-operative outcome and mortality, delaying um, uh, uh, the arterial switch. So if a patient presents at three days of age, we would do the arterial switch at three days of age. So um, th there, is, there is no... Um, rationale for, for delaying him because he will not grow in three weeks and, and nothing will change much in three weeks. On the other hand, they are a lot more stable uh, very early on. So um, typically we want to do that at the, at the first week of age. Um, I acknowledge this is not very possible, especially in our circumstances, but this is what she, we should aim at. I'm totally agreeing, Hatem, and again to uh, deliver the message uh, 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 very clear that a Rushkin procedure should be done only to uh, critically L uh, neonates, uh, and a Rushkin procedure shouldn't be done for good. It should be done as a bridge to an arterial switch, and arterial switch should be the sooner the better. Am I right? Yes. Exactly. Right. And another Thank point, so uh, Khaled, uh, to be added here, uh, there is an important message. Some cardiologists or some pediatrician are very fair and they will start to prostaglandin uh, even if the patient has good saturation. Please uh, 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 call your cardiologist. Please uh, rapidly, uh, you can start if uh, definitely if in an emergency situation, but when the cardiologist comes, there are very important, do I can maintain this uh, patient without prostaglandin, is I'm in a higher cardiac center or I refer to a, a remote cardiac center. These are very important and these are very complicated questions, but we need uh, to, uh, uh, in such critical condition, do rush rapidly, get him off the prostaglandin rapidly and refer him to surgery rapidly. So timing is very crucial. So, uh, so yes, exactly. Um, I, I totally agree. Uh, Rushkin is an, is an important tool, uh, can very well stabilize patients. Um, uh, Prostin is an important tool, again, can very well stabilize patients, but both should be uh, judged uh, um, wisely because they, they both do have um, um, side effects. So the Rushkin can cause LV to decontagion faster and obviously uh, problems with vascular access and things like that. Most of the time, it makes a lot of good for, for the patients, but uh, some patients might not uh, need it. So if a patient is already in a, in a center that has a cardiac uh, uh, service and the operation will be done in one or two days and the saturation is 70s, I would not do a Rushkin. And the same as the for, for the prostin. Uh, prostin, uh, although stabilizes patients, open the duct, but also can cause prostin apnea, uh, cause the patient to get ventilated, and then you get ventilated associated pneumonia, and then you never come out of this. So although these are um, uh, strong tools, we have to use them wisely. I'm totally uh, agreeing with all your comments. We have uh, a very fruitful uh, discussion from Dr. Hani Adil. Uh, he's discussing this point. Uh, he agrees also that delivering oxygen, uh, the, the point I, uh, I told uh, Khaled and Hatem, that delivering oxygen to the brain is through maintaining adequate oxygen. And this is the recent data which favors uh, that uh, maintaining a good saturation and good neuro, uh, neurocognitive function will be very important. And, not delaying either the Rushkin or the surgery. So these are very important points. Do we cover every questions in such a uh, point? Okay, I will move to... 
Thank okay, you very much, you... all, and for the and for the uh, contribution from from all the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hay. Okay, we we will move to the next uh, slides. So uh, the first type uh, is the intact septum. We uh, we uh, we discussed uh, the whole uh, idea about it. These are were the most important and the most dangerous and the most life threatening. What are other types of transposition? We have the uh, second uh, common type is the transposition with ventricular septal defect. This is a figure. Uh, specimen, anatomical specimen. Here I'm opening from the right ventricle. So we can see the uh, uh, ventricular septal defect. And this is the aorta. But usually uh, in transposition, we say that it is a subpulmonic ventricular septal defect. So how I describe uh, my case, this is a four chamber view. As we see that in such cases, the ventricular uh, size is different. This is a loaded ventricle. This ventricle is loaded by uh, a higher uh, volume load and hence the pulmonary pressure is uh, maintained. So this ventricle is much more capable of maintaining systemic circulation for a, a longer period. So we can see um, uh, unrestricted VSD, which means that the LV is exposed to systemic pressure and having the large VSD causes the pulmonary blood flow to be very high. So again, the, the venous return and the volume load into the left ventricle is high. So this ventricle is pressure and volume loaded, which maintains it uh, quite uh, in a good condition. Okay, uh, to, uh, mean, uh, to discuss the difference, this ventricle is loaded for a while. So a uh, very important message that these patients, if uh, maintaining good saturation by uh, adequate septum uh, atrial uh, mixing and uh, ventricular mixing, this patient might, might uh, be done at a later stage. This is completely different from the other spectrum, which is the intact uh, ventricular septum, which should be done, as Dr. Hatem said, in the first th uh, three weeks or the first months. It differs from, uh, uh, from paper to another, but they are very emergency and should be done uh, rapidly. The, uh, so this type yes, it presents at four months of age. Yes. Uh, would you would you would he still be switchable? At four months, in a, which type, Doctor Head? The TGVSD, large VSD. For sure. Okay, so so this keeps him switchable. So do you recommend if a patient presents at one week of age, would you recommend for him to follow up and do the operation later? Uh, it depends on uh, several factors. Uh, it depends, uh, do I have a good mixing on the atrial uh, level? Because as you know, Dr. Hatem, that the mixing on the ventricular level is a little bit lower the, or, or, or uh, not adequate like the uh, atrial septal uh, level. Uh, okay. If I have a good saturation, if the VSD is unrestrictive, I would keep him for a while, yes. This is my um. answer. Uh, on the other hand, uh, although from the from the switchability point of view and maintaining saturation, he might be better. But on the other hand, these patients um, uh, can suffer significant heart failure. And on the other hand, they they present uh, with uh, significantly earlier uh, pulmonary vascular disease. So um, w w uh, patients can develop significant pulmonary vascular disease at um, uh, like after six months of age, six, seven, eight months of age. So uh, this is a lot earlier than what we see in the, uh, the same size of the VSD without the transposition. So mm -hmm. although, although yes, um, the VSD can keep the, the ventricle switchable and can maintain saturation, but um, uh, we should not uh, routinely delay patients with VSD, with TGA VSD, like what we do in the in unrestricted VSD, we, we tell him do the operation at three to six months of age. If a patient with a TGA VSD presents at two weeks of age, we would still do the operation. Yeah, uh, if you present it at the time, we will do. But uh, yeah. uh, if you have a limited resource, do you agree to- uh, uh, Obviously, if, if he presents late or if you have limited resources and there is another patient who is actually very critical, yeah, okay, you, you allocate the resources. But I mean, we do not routinely delay them. Yes, I agree, agree with you. Uh, then uh, we can uh, move. 
So this is another case. So we can see that the, this is a moderate sized ventricular septal defect. This is a, an apical five chamber view. This is the pulmonary. It's a very illustrative vessel with a branching pattern. So I got my case. I have also unrestricted ventricular septal defect. We can see uh, later uh, that uh, this is un unrestrictive. And we can see that the ventricle is maintaining uh, adequate size and the function in such cases. So a very important entity or very close to the TGA ventricular septal defect is the uh, double outlet right ventricle malposed vessels, uh, what we uh, know as a Tausig Bing anomaly. So uh, I will not. Uh, that's, get another, in... that's another topic. Uh, have you gone yeah. out of the TGA? No, 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 not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm leaving uh, the Dorf uh, presentation for the, uh, the coming webinars for Dr. Okay. Hatton, but it has the same pathophysiology. That's why I need to discuss because. The double outlet right ventricle malposed grid vessels have the same pathophysiology of the TGA. Uh, it might have uh, the same uh, treatment, which is arterial switch, with a, a little bit of uh, implications. We will discuss it together in the coming webinars, in the coming, uh, next webinar, actually. But what is the difference between the TGA VSD and the toxic Bing anomaly? The, uh, the main whole difference is that the pulmonary artery or the two great vessels arise entirely from the right ventricle. This is the toxic Bing anomaly. I will show it. So uh, this is uh, here we I will stop. So as we see, this is the interior chamber. This is the posterior chamber. This is the first vessel. So this is uh, the first great vessel, and this is the second vessel. So. The uh, both great vessels originate entirely from the right ventricle. This is a very nice case. We can see that uh, also there is uh, uh, an uh, overriding more than 50%. So we'll go for uh, uh, the toxic Bing diagnosis. This is a sweeping anteriorly. We can see that the, the left ventricle, no vessels originate, or the pulmonary overrides the defect with more than 50%, and then the aorta arises anteriorly from the right ventricle. So these cases are called toxic Bing or double outlet right ventricle, male posed vessels with uh, both vessels originate from the right ventricle. Do you have any comments here, uh, Dr. Hatton? So, uh, uh, yes, agree. Uh, the, the physiology of the toxic Bing anomaly uh, is very, very similar to TGAVSD. So, again, to summarize, toxic Bing anomaly is a patient who has um, uh, a double outlet right ventricle with subpulmonic VSD and double outlet right ventricle, so more than. 50% um, of both great vessels come from the right ventricle. So the aorta, aorta comes totally from the right ventricle and more than 50% of the pulmonary artery comes from the right ventricle uh, with, the, with the pulmonary artery overriding uh, the VSD. Uh, so the, the pathophysiology, the presentation, and the management is very, very similar to patients who have um, TGA VSD because, because of the streaming, most of the blood coming from the left ventricle goes into the pulmonary artery, going back into the lungs while the deoxygenated blood in the right ventricle goes mo most, uh, uh, mostly goes to the uh, aorta, while um, uh, the pulmonary flow is high because of the um, a lot of blood, again, in the right, right and left ventricle can go into the pulmonary artery, so pulmonary flow is much higher because they communicate. So very, very similar in physiology and actually presentation and management uh, with the TGA VSD. Um, why do, the, do we differentiate if they are very similar? Because they are still different. Patients with toxic Bing anomaly uh, tend to have more likely the great vessels coming side by side rather than anthroposterior like the TGA, which actually makes the, the arterial switch more difficult. Um, uh, they tend to have more uh, coronary abnormalities, actually the, the bad ones with the intramural coronaries and single coronaries. So they have um, uh, worse uh, coronary anatomy, which makes again the arterial switch um, more risky. Um, the closure of the VSD is technically more difficult in the operation and with more risk of injuring the, the conduction. Um, and actually has the bad reputation of having low flow into the ascending aorta because of the anterior deviated coronal septum, which narrows the 
sub aortic um, uh, area uh, and this causes less um, uh, blood going into the distal arch so uh, many of these patients will have um, hypoplastic aortic arch which then makes it operation so um, 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 many of these patients will require uh, having RT VSD closure and um, uh, repair of hypoplastic aortic arch so yes they are similar but they are also different okay exactly so thank you uh, uh, well, thank you, Dr. Hatem. Uh, the third type uh, or the third spectrum of transposition is the TGA with a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And as Dr. Sara stated in her uh, initial intro, and Dr. Hatem stated, uh, what we mean by left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is the subpulmonic or uh, pulmonic obstruction, because here the uh, Pulmonary originating from the left ventricle. Keep in mind in that situation. So, what are the different mechanisms I do have in obstructing the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction? I could have uh, obstruction at the valvular level, so I could have uh, a fixed obstruction or <clears throat> valvular stenosis. Sorry, I could have a deviated, a posteriorly deviated outlet septum uh, bulging into the outflow tract obstruction here. I could have a tissue tags, aneurysmal tissue bulging into the outflow tract obstruction. I could have a fibrous ridge or discrete membrane. I could have a anomalous tension apparatus. So these are different variable mechanism. These are different uh, types of uh, outflow tract obstruction. In each type, the strategy or the surgery will differ. So uh, first of all, I need to tell the surgeon what is the degree of obstruction, what is the mechanism of obstruction, and is this obstruction fixed or dynamic? Because as we will see, uh, the fixed obstruction will have uh, uh, different management from the dynamic obstruction. This is a specimen, anatomical specimen, uh, where we have aneurysmal tissue bulging or have uh, what, we, uh, what we call uh, <clears throat> the the aneurysmal uh, tissue tags bulging into uh, the uh, outflow tract obstruction. So we will start by the most uh, common is the uh, fixed outflow tract obstruction. This is uh, uh, a short, uh, a subcostal uh, view at the ventricular level. We can see here that this is a ventricular septal defect. We can see that the pulmonary originating from the left ventricle and the aorta originating from the right ventricle. But as we see, the, the, there is a difference in the annuli. If I, if I stop here, we can see that the aortic annuli is much more bigger and there is a fixed pulmonic and subpulmonic obstruction. This is what we see that uh, a fixed obstruction. Moving to the color flow, we can see that the ventricular uh, defect shunting entirely right to left because the uh, the pressure in the right side is higher than the left side, definitely. And the aliasing or the obstruction starts both at the valvular level and subvalvular level. And in such cases, very important to uh, show the surgeon because uh, this will change the, the, the decision. This makes uh, the switchable is a very difficult uh, decision. And uh, we will discuss in the uh, strategy in the surgical strategies, what are other alternative options? Agreeing, uh, Dr. Heaven? Yes, 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 sir. Okay, we'll move to other mechanisms. What are other mechanisms? Sorry. This is a different case. Here, uh, sorry. This is uh, obstruction in the outflow tract causing by bulging aneurysmal uh, tissue or a uh, tissue tag, bulging just beneath the pulmonary valve. So I would state that this is a dynamic obstruction rather than fixed. So if I uh, show it to the surgeon and the surgeon see that this uh, tissue tag is, uh, could be excised, so this patient might have an arterial switch. So it is very important to determine the mechanism and the degree. 
the wind soak effect of some tissue tag, uh, and it usually excites easily, and uh, the patient can be switched. So, so these are um, these are usually uh, accessory mitral tissue, and as you say, um, we have to uh, uh, very uh, accurately uh, uh, decide if this uh, if excising this tissue would affect uh, mitral valve function or not, uh, because then again you wouldn't want to have uh, a totally destroyed mitral valve in a two weeks uh, old um, in uh, neonate. So. Uh, um, if we really decide that this uh, 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 access is an accessory, really accessory mitral uh, tissue, and uh, the rest of the mitral apparatus is uh, well functioning and can be competent after excising this, um, this can be excised to open the LVOT. Yeah. Okay, goes uh, in the same condition if I have a discrete membrane or if I have a uh, fibrous ridge, uh, the same condition here, if I excise this discrete membrane or ridge, I would uh, favor arterial switch. In rare conditions, I could have different mechanism of uh, subpulmonic obstruction or outflow tract obstruction caused by uh, anomalous uh, tension apparatus or uh, in rare condition, cleft of a mitral valve. So we can see here, this is a sub uh, view or subcostal view where there is a cleft in the mitral valve and uh, it's far away from uh, the pulmonary. So if I manage to close such cleft, the pulmonary, uh, the, the outflow tract usually widened and uh, I confirm by diagnosis that uh, the gradient is not that much high. Although it doesn't have in the implication, it depends whether the surgeon can close such cleft without, uh, with uh, keeping the outflow tract patent or not. So this is a very important mechanism. And is that the cleft of an AV canal, yes sir? So is that an associated AV canal to the TGE or is that an isolated cleft? No, this was an isolated cleft in transposition, not an AV canal. And how, how would you determine that? Okay, so uh, we have uh, the uh, webinar, we have stated uh, <laughs> that uh, the, the cleft, uh, the isolated cleft bulged towards the outflow tract. And as we yeah. see uh, here, the cleft direction is towards the outflow leg, unlike the cleft of the AV canal, which uh, bulged towards the septum uh, or Agreed. directed towards the septum. Agree. Okay. Agree. Uh, what are other mechanisms? We have different mechanisms. One important mechanism, sorry, one important mechanism is uh, posterior deviation of the ventricular septum. In some cases, we can have a VSD and we can have the uh, ventricular septum bulging on the outflow tract away from the pulmonary valve. So it might cause a subpulmonic obstruction, but in such cases, it is very important to ask the surgeon, can you uh, uh, excise the ventricular septum in such cases? Do you will end with a heart block? So this is very important. So the, so the nice thing here is that um, uh, conal septum does not have um, uh, conduction tissue. So uh, it is safe from the conduction point of view, but actually it can be very, very near to the pulmonary valve, which in the arterial switch would be um, an aortic valve. So if the excision causes uh, injury to that, to that valve, this is a, a big problem. And on the other hand, if you do not excise it well, and we do arterial switch, we get significant LV tube obstruction. Again, in a new which is which is not a good thing. So the, these are the tricky ones. So uh, um, we have to assess that the the valve annulus is really really good, so it will be uh, uh, favorable for uh, uh, functioning as an aortic valve. But also we make sure that there is no residual obstruction and there is no injury um, to the valve by excising the the conal septum itself. But exactly. uh, at least the good news is that there is no conduction in this specific area. <laughs> okay, so uh, your decision, uh, Dr. Hatem, not based on, uh, uh, on uh, the conduction uh, injury, but based on how far it's uh, away from the pulmonary valve and uh, uh, how much you, will, you can excise without causing obstruction, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, very important uh, also entity is the juxta 
position of the atrial appendage. Why it is important? Why I could uh, detect it? Because it is uh, sometimes we can uh, find uh, this uh, juxtaposition. What first of all? What what do we mean by juxtaposition? This means that both atrial appendage, <clears throat> the left and the right appendage, are on the same side of the great vessels. We can ha have either left juxtaposition or uh, right juxtaposition. Uh, what is the difference? Why do we need to know? Because uh, in uh, echo assessment, they might uh, be uh, misdiagnosed as atrial septal defect. And also they have surgical implication. We will discuss it uh, in the coming webinar in uh, some surgical procedures as we will see later. So left juxtaposition of the atrial appendage, it is important to diagnose, can be confused with ASD. Atrial septum appears perpendicular to the diaphragm and absence of the septum is important with a bidirectional color flow across. But this is a still image. This is a very confusing. What, how can we differentiate? We have a good echo image here. We can detect, uh, we can move. We usually use the subcostal view. Uh, is very important. We will stop here <clears throat> to determine the anatomy. And this is a very good view. This is the IVC. This is the right atrium. <clears throat> this is the left atrium. And this is the narrow left atrial appendage. If we sweep uh, anteriorly, we can detect this. This is the right atrial appendage, uh, juxtaposed towards the left atrial appendage. And here we can see it. So this is the juxtaposed uh, atrial appendage. This is not an ASD. It is very important to differentiate. It looks, and looks like a wide open ASD. So in these patients, we would say <clears throat> he has a very good mixing. Yes. But on the other hand, it's not. So this is a very tricky and we should uh, detect it. So we can detect it either from uh, the high parst external view, uh, we, uh, if we have a, a, high, a, good, a good parasternal view also, we can, here we can see the juxtaposed right atrial appendage towards the other side here, the juxtaposed right atrial appendage, and this is the two great vessels. So it is not an ASD. Please make sure in such cases not to uh, misdiagnose uh, uh, an ASD. Also, this is a very interesting case. Uh, the same view that we usually depend on the sub coastal view in detecting such uh, cases. Here we also we have a juxtaposed uh, right uh, atrial appendage towards the atrial appendage. Uh, definitely, uh, we will discuss with Dr. Hatem in the coming webinar why they are important and if we find a juxtaposition, we why uh, we will. Uh, we will have, but uh, we will keep it to the next webinar. Agreed. Yes, to asking different questions. <laughs> <laughs> we will I, like, uh, okay. Uh, we I would like on. also. I would like also, Esther, to highlight the importance of uh, clinical uh, criteria in this situation. It's very difficult to have uh, 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 this misdiagnosed as a large uh, ESD and having cyanose baby. Uh, exactly. That's why also the clinical picture is very important to be integrated with the echocardiographic findings. Exactly. I agree. Exactly. I agree. Totally. I agree. Okay. Uh, what are uh, what is the most important here? Is the uh, the position of the great vessels, the relation of the great vessels, the alignment of the commissures? These are questions we can usually answer from the high parasternal view. What is the most common relation? Is the anterior, the aorta is anterior and to the right is the most common here, as we see with a good uh, commissural alignment. But we can have other different relations, like side by side uh, great vessels. But it most likely to have uh, coronary artery uh, variability and uh, unfavorable coronary artery anatomy. We can have the aorta directly anterior and pulmonary directly posterior. Rarely we can have the aorta anterior and to the left, but it's usually associated with a smallish right ventricle or hypoplasia of the right ventricle, and very rare to have the aorta posterior, but we have seen such uh, uh, variables. 
very important to ask is the alignment of the commissions, if the commissions of both great vessels align together, because if the sorry, <clears throat> because if the great vessels are not aligned together, usually have uh, surgical implications and carries the risk of coronary abnormality. And we usually we detect it from the hypersternal view. The most important uh, 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 information the surgeon need to know, uh, it, what are the type of the coronaries? We have different classifications. We have different coronary variables. We have uh, different uh, uh, coronary uh, anatomy. Uh, but first of all, I would like to emphasize important point that the coronary view from the surgeon point is different from the cardiology point. But in transposition, uh, they classified uh, the uh, posterior facing sinus as sinus one is the uh, left sided sinus and sinus two is the uh, right sided sinus. But not to be confused, uh, uh, the surgeon perspective is different from the cardiology perspective. Do you have any comment here, Hatem? So to, um, uh, to unify um, nomenclature and so that everybody can communicate together. Um, and since you've just said the relationship of the great vessels can be very variable. So usually the aorta is anterior to the right while the pulmonary is posterior to the left. Uh, but, but they can very frequently be side by side or even the aorta posterior. So instead of just describing right and left coronaries or the side uh, of the patient, so the coronary toward the right side of the patient or left side of the patient, we just uh, describe uh, the coronaries uh, in, in relation to the great vessels. So we assume um, as if I'm standing inside the aortic root, looking into the pulmonary root. The sinus on my, my right hand side, we call this sinus one. And the sinus on my left hand side is sinus two. Regardless if I'm anterior, posterior, right, and left to the patient, I am just facing the pulmonary root. So the right side, the right-handed facing sinus is sinus one. Left-handed facing sinus is sinus two. Now we're looking from surgeon perspective. I mean, we're transecting the great vessels from and looking from above. Uh, just note that um, uh, in echo views. Uh, it is as if you are looking from below, so they are they are just flipped, but it's the same the same principle. So we call these uh, like that because um, we don't say uh, left main coronary coming from one sinus and the other because um, um, very frequently um, uh, the circumflex artery can come from the uh, from the right coronary. So we just um, uh, mention. Uh, the origin of the three major coronaries, LAD, circumflex, and RCE, and we describe them. So we do have uh, many, many classifications. We're actually very familiar with the Yakub classification. I think you'll, you'll present that. But uh, to, to just be easy for everybody to communicate, just describe what you see, which coronary comes from which sinus, and um, this is the way we like to describe it so that everybody can uh, communicate together. I hope this is clear. to simplify for all of us and for all audience, uh, 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 would you please uh, uh, describe again how uh, you uh, uh, named the sinuses and its relation to uh, the pulmonary artery, regardless of uh, the position of the patient? Thank you, Khal. So uh, uh, let's assume that we have transected exactly like the, the image um, uh, our colleague Yasser is showing. So as if we've transected both um, uh, great vessels and looking from above, and now I'm, assu I'm assume I'm sitting inside the aortic root and looking towards the pulmonary root. We regardless now have regardless of the position of the patient. Regardless if I am on the right side, anterior or posterior, regardless, or I'm just looking towards the pulmonary root. Great. And uh, and then um, uh, so there will be two sinuses facing the pulmonary root. One will be on my right-hand side, and the other will be on my left-hand side. The one on my right-hand side, we call this sinus one, and the one on my left-hand side is sinus two. 
this is usually I'm sitting anterior and to the right of the pulmonary, but regardless, I can, I can be side by side, I can be even posterior. Still, the one on my right hand side while sitting inside the aortic root facing the pulmonary root, the sinus on my right hand side is sinus one, the other one is sinus two. And the, the one that is not facing the, uh, the pulmonary artery, we call that the non facing sinus. So, and, and we're, we're happy that coronaries do not come out of non-facing sinus, otherwise that would be really tricky. Okay, and okay, this is so. a pure surgical view. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, sir, would you please explain for us the difference between the surgical and the echocardiographic view? Okay, uh, I will uh, explain thoroughly in the coming uh, slides, uh, Khaled, but uh, here I would emphasize two points. Uh, there have been different classification. One of the most universal and still valid till now is the Yaqub classifications. Uh, Professor Magda Yaqub and Radley Smith have published this class classification in 1987 with the anatomy of the coronary uh, uh, artery in transposition and different methods of their transfer. He has explained such anatomy in 19 cases, just only. The usual anatomy uh, is the, uh, the two coronary arising from the posterior facing sinus. The different variable uh, is uh, he classified into five types, type A, type B, type C, type D, and type E. The type B and C are very close to each other. Uh, type B from a single ostium, type C from uh, two different ostium. Type D is usually similar to type A, but uh, circumflex arise from the uh, right coronary, uh, while type E is different with the right coronary originate anterior to the aorta. This is a so very difficult. Common... Yes. So, so the most common pattern is that um, uh, LED and circumflex come out from sinus one, while RCE comes from sinus two, exactly. uh, which is in this classification is type A. The second most common is type D, with, where the uh, circumflex artery comes with uh, the RCA from sinus two, while LED comes separately from sinus one. And uh, uh, we're, we're happy that these are the easier uh, uh, ones uh, for, for the switch. Uh, the other are, are more difficult and luckily they are, they are more rare. Agree, but what I hear, uh, this is uh, uh, what, uh, what message I want to, to uh, deliver here for all audience, please. Although there are different classifications, although uh, Professor Yaqub's uh, classification is still universal, although most of us use this classification, but if you are going to describe the coronary anatomy, please be descriptive. Describe the coronary anatomy as you see. Well, like uh, Dr. Hatem said, that the uh, left uh, coronary and circumflex arise from sinus one, and uh, right coronary arise from sinus two. This is more, uh, more easily for, uh, because not all surgeons are familiar with uh, such classification. I would emphasize on this message, please be descriptive in your uh, report uh, regarding the corona. Uh, be, uh, because we also have other variables. In such case, as you see in this schematic diagram, we have the circ and the right coronary from uh, sinus two, while the uh, LED arising from sinus one, we, we can have intramural coronaries. So as uh, Dr. Khalid said, what is the uh, echocardiography uh, perspectives? We have different perspectives, but uh, in some hints might help. If you find the coronary crossing posterior to the pulmonary, it could be a circumflex or single, uh, single RCA. If it is anterior to the aorta, it might be single LCA or inverted RCA, but we need to see this in images. So the, this I see the echocardiography perspective, which is quite different from the uh, surgeon perspective. Here, to, uh, to fix the image, this is the aorta anterior to the right. This is the pulmonary. So uh, here, I, I will move it again. This is sinus one. This is uh, sinus two. So the LED originating from sinus one, while the right coronary is originating from sinus two. This is the 65%. This is the usual coronary anatomy. This is the most important uh, to describe like that. So I would describe here. This is very uh, important image. I can see both the coronaries, the LED and circ uh, coming from sinus one while the right coronary comes from sinus two. So this is very important. 
do you have any questions before moving to the uh, abnormal variables of coronaries? Okay, I will move to the different coronary variables. Uh, I, I, uh, we can face uh, different variability and very important to describe to the surgeon what are variables because it will have surgical implication. I could have a single coronary uh, arising from uh, either sinus one or sinus two. Here I have a single coronary trunk where I have the right coronary moving anteriorly and the uh, left system, all of them arising from the same sinus with a single ostia. And it is very important to show it to the surgeons to have a strategy before uh, trans, uh, locating the coronaries. Also, I could have uh, uh, very close commissures, either from single ostia or from different ostia. So this is very important here. I could have uh, two coronaries arriving from uh, different uh, ostia on both sides of commissure. Again, I could have uh, uh, abnormal coronary variant like uh, single coronary ostia, whether arising from uh, sinus one or sinus two. The most important coronary variable is the intramural coronary artery. What we mean by intramural coronary artery, it means that part of the coronary is moving into the aortic wall. And what is the surgical implication? That this intramural part will not be seen by the surgeon. If uh, he did not detect it, he will injure the, uh, the left uh, coronary because here it starts, so he would have his button here, but instead he will have his button here, so he will injure the coronary. This is a high parasternal uh, long axis view. Uh, uh, it shows an intramural course. I, if you uh, stop this image here, you will say that this is a, a normal very uh, normal coronary uh, anatomy with the uh, left uh, system arising from sinus one. But if you checked here, I will uh, get two seconds here. The left, there is an intramural course. So it's not here, it is from here. So it, it will have important surgical implication for the surgeon to cut at a higher level or a different level to avoid injury of the coronary system. Any, any comments here, Hatton? So, um, uh... You've described very well uh, uh, different variations of the of the coronary arteries, and as you say, this is really a crucial step in the arterial switch operation. Although, in principle, um, uh, no coronary anatomy should um, um, uh, say that this uh, the arterial switch is a contraindication or uh, should not be done. Um, all variations of coronaries have had a different surgical technique for uh, for switching. But this makes the operation really, really more difficult. And on the other hand, um, um, difficult coronary patterns uh, can significantly affect out outcome. So one of the major uh, risk factors for mortality is uh, a very difficult uh, coronary variants. So uh, uh, as you say, um, it's good to have an idea so that we're, we're, uh, we're prepared. And on the other hand, if, uh, uh, if the surgeon is um, and not very experienced uh, doing such co uh, coronary uh, uh, variants, he, he probably should not be the one doing that on his own. So th this effect, uh, who is doing the operation and, and what is the technique being done? Uh, but this is not like the deconditioned left ventricle where you just uh, avoid doing the arterial switch uh, uh, on the whole and do a totally different operation. Okay, so it is uh, so it is uh, the variant rather than classifications. So what you are concerned about, is it a variable coronary anatomy rather than the classifications? So I, I would like to emphasize one important point that there is no coronary abnormality uh, will contraindicate that, that contra switchability. No, this, this should not be the case. Yes. Okay, but uh, it will carry a higher risk and we should be aware of this variability and we should take care uh, during uh, uh, translocation of the coronaries or re-implantation of this uh, corona abnormal coronaries. Agree, yes. Hatton? Yes, 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 thank you. So we'll move to, to the next. 
So uh, the arch abnormality spectrum, uh, why is the arch uh, very important? Because we could have a variable spectrum of arch. Uh, how we detect the arch? Definitely through the uh, suprasternal view, whether the long axis or the short axis view, guided by other multimodality imaging. So we could have uh, a, a whole uh, spectrum of uh, a tight coarctation. We could have just the bulging of the ductus in the uh, arch, or we could have an interrupted aortic arch. So this is uh, a figure shows that the arch are rising from the right ventricle, and we could have a, a whole uh, hypoplastic aortic arch. So it is very important to detect by echo the arch anatomy whether this is a favorable arch, because it have a very different strategy, because if you are going to switch patients with a normal arch, will differ from uh, repairing such arch. So this uh, is uh, a case where uh, there is a posterior deviation uh, of the ductus arteriosus into uh, the arch with a laminar flow. So this is very important. We have a, a small uh, ductus arteriosus, and uh, it uh, you can discuss with the surgeon. Uh, do you have to, to repair such a defect or not? Another case, you can have a widened PDA or a large unrestricted PDA with a small uh, caliber of the distal or transverse arch, and you could have the whole hypoplastic aortic arch starting from the proximal to the transverse to the distal segment. And here uh, you should uh, discuss with the surgeon, do you have, uh, uh, what is the type of the repair? Are you going to repair uh, this arch? But in such conditions, I think you will need another modality of imaging because you have different surgical techniques. You can have either uh, end to end anastomosis or uh, a whole arch repair. So the surgeon will ask you for a different modality. So you will go for multi-slice CT because the, uh, the CT is very important in delineating the arch anatomy. Uh, this is uh, some images uh, where we can see the aorta anterior and pulmonary posterior. And we can detect the either you have a discrete aorta, uh, discrete coarctation, or entirely hypoplastic aortic arch. And uh, you can have a, a, a fruitful discussion with the surgeon. What is uh, the type of arch? Do you have a discrete coarctation? Do you have interrupted arch? Do you have a hypoplastic arch? What is your surgical approach in different cases? And definitely we will discuss this uh, a strategy in the coming webinar. Uh, any comment, Hatim, here? Um, I agree, yes, sir. Uh, uh, it is important to know the the extent of the hypoplasia of the arch, or is it a discrete coarctation? Uh, and different techniques are, are valid here, and we do that during the same operation. So it is uh, still accessible from a median sternotomy uh, on cardiopulmonary pass, but uh, we frequently need to do um, uh, maneuvers on the bypass machine uh, during the arch repair, either total secretary arrest or uh, or uh, with selective uh, integrated um, brain perfusion. So different techniques uh, you can do, as you said, extend end to end anastomosis. Can do patch augmentation of the arch or reimplantation of the descending aorta into the proximal arch. So there are different techniques here. Uh, it is important to know the the extent of the of the of the arch hypoplasia or is it the discrete stenosis so as you said uh, it's either uh, either echo sh uh, shows very clear images or we frequently go to the ct to see uh, to see the rest of the head vessels and and uh, um, extent of the hypoplasia and we can measure these scores on that and decide because sometimes uh, in patients with large vsd with very high pulmonary flow or sometimes with large pda uh, the area of the distal arch is a bit uh, slightly underfed, slightly narrowed, uh, but not typically uh, uh, quark. So uh, deciding here can be a bit tricky. So also the CT can help, and then we can measure um, uh, the arch in, in millimeters and uh, adjust that to the Z-score of the patients and his body weight, and things like that. So do you commend uh, doing a multi-slice CT 
in every case where we have a question about the arch or you will go for the echo image first not necessarily see. not necessarily routinely but but low threshold if the the echo images are very 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 clear you can get all the information from there um yes you can do that uh, but otherwise if you have any any questions not totally answered by echo then then you go for the ct Definitely. So this is very important uh, to determine or have an adequate decision. And we definitely will discuss together uh, the surgical strategies. This is a, a comprehensive uh, echo report have been published in 2016 by the American Society of Echocardiography in determining a standardized protocol preoperative in all cases of transposition where we can approach through, through the subcostal and apical and parasternal and Finally, the suprasternal, where we can uh, get the full information, uh, the full uh, decision, and it is very comprehensive, and you can get it from literature or we can send the paper. It's a very good report uh, determining standardized echo protocol or multimodality imaging protocol in diagnosis cases of transposition. So, uh, it is uh, not our scope of this lecture. We will keep it for the uh, last lecture, but we are challenging our surgeon here. Uh, if you have uh, a case of a transposition, uh, uh, you should ask, do you have a ventricular septal defect? Uh, if no, uh, you will next ask your question. Is the left ventricular uh, conditioned? If the left ventricular condition, so primary arterial switch is the uh, favorable uh, strategy. If, if uh, LV is not conditioned, you will move either to a two-stage repair or atrial uh, switch uh, operation. If uh, you uh, have a ventricular septal defect, you, the next question, do you have a, a, an outflow tract obstruction? No, so is the patient is Eisenmenger or not? If not Eisenmenger, you will go for arterial switch. If Eisenmenger, you, you might think about palliative atrial switch. Uh, if you have uh, outflow tract obstruction, whether this is a dynamic or uh, fixed, if dynamic and resectable, you will go for arterial switch. If uh, not uh, dynamic and fixed, then you will have other alternative, either Rastelli or uh, BT shunt or BT shunt first, then Rastelli or uh, Nikaido procedure. And definitely, Dr. Hatton will have a very good lecture next week about different surgical strategy. But this is a scheme of our way of thinking for all cases of uh, transposition. Our take home message is that uh, the transposition is one of the uh, most common. Uh, congenital cyanotic uh, heart disease. Proper diagnosis and management depend on several uh, strategies. Standard echo approach would be very fruitful for proper decision making. Multimodality imaging may be integrated for proper diagnosis and management of such cases. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, um, dear friend Yasser, for the really nice talk. Um, um, su such a such an important uh, topic and such a difficult one actually. So uh, as you said, TGA is not a rare disease. It's quite common. Uh, most patients will unfortunately die within the first year um, if not um, uh, treated properly. Um, the 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 management of the arterial switch is actually uh, of the TGA uh, as a whole is quite challenging, and it's not a single uh, pathway. Uh, to just uh, like any patient who has a VSD, you just close the VSD or AV canal, you repair the AV canal. Actually, um, patients can go in a really different pathways uh, with varying complexity and uh, varying outcome. Um, so uh, th thank you for giving a comprehensive talk about uh, uh, assessment. And probably we'll inshallah, be talking the next, uh, next webinar about uh, different um, uh, management um, strategies. Thank you, Dr. Hatem. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hatem. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasser, uh, Dr. Khalid Shams, uh, Dr. Shoa Rumeh. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sara Muscatelli, for this great introduction. Uh, Dr. Yasser, this was uh, 
a really challenging talk. We dealt with actually very nice and smooth, elegant scientific discussion with uh, Hatem, Khaled, Soha, Sara. Uh, I was enjoying it so much. Uh, lots of uh, lots of uh, our audience on YouTube are enjoying this valuable discussion so much. I'm very glad that we learn uh, through. Uh, a simplified uh, discussion that uh, helps us uh, to answer all the brainstorming questions that jump to our brain while you are showing this uh, highly scientific uh, talk. Uh, I like this way of teaching and learning because uh, some way or another you can remember the scientific information either by reading it or seeing a diagram, but it would be much better also if you learn it or from the experts by uh, teaching you their experience from a practical point of view. Uh, thank you so much, really, from the depth of my heart. Thank you again, Sarah, Yasser, Hatem, Khaled, Soha, everyone for this wonderful discussion. Uh, next Saturday at the same time also, 9.30 p.m. Uh, Cairo time, uh, Central European time plus 2 GMT. We will be discussing the second part of the TGA in a webinar involving the different uh, clinical scenarios uh, prepared by uh, Dr. Yasser and moderated by Dr. Hatem and Dr. Soha and Dr. Khalid as well. So uh, I can't wait to see you again next week. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasser, Hatem, Soha, Khalid, and Sarah for this great webinar. And thank, thank you. you all of our audience for your valuable discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dara. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk, Thank you. Thank you very much.